Good morning from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. My name is Heather Exner Pro. I'm the managing editor of the Arctic Yearbook, a member of the Global Arctic Mission Council, uh, a senior policy fellow at the McDonald Laurie Institute, and also a global fellow at the Polar Institute of the Wilson Center. And it's my pleasure here to host the Arctic Circle's very first webcast session uh, using the power of technology to bring uh, you know good conversation and length thought on the Arctic to uh, to the rest of you. So this morning, uh, myself and my colleague, Lassie Heinonen, are going to be talking about cooperation in the Arctic and its impacts on Arctic security and getting into the question of what kind of cooperation can we have given these new geopolitical circumstances we find ourselves in. Lassie Heinonen, also known as Mr. Arctic to many of you, uh, is the chair of the Global Arctic Mission Council, Professor Emeritus at the University of Lapland, and also the editor of the Arctic Yearbook. We've been working together for a decade on the Arctic Yearbook and would normally have this conversation just ourselves, maybe over a Zoom beer, but happy to have this conversation with the rest of you as well. Feel free to use the Q&A uh, component of Zoom uh, to submit your questions. I have lots of questions for Lassie. We have lots to talk about, but we would love some audience participation and comments and, and questions also. So Lassie, let's get started. How has this how has this terrible Russian invasion of Ukraine affected Arctic cooperation and security now? Hello, uh, Heather, and, and, and thank you for your uh, kind uh, introduction. And uh, good afternoon from Torshavn, uh, the Faroe Islands, uh, where I have been uh, a few, few, few days now. Uh, well, although the, the sun is shining here in Torshavn today, or the, the, the current situation in the Arctic region is, is not, not that bright. Uh, absolutely, this is a new situation when, when uh, cooperation between the eight Arctic states is in pause, fortunately not terminated. But, but however, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a new situation which can be taken as a test or, or even, even a challenge. That, that how we will manage to pass uh, uh, this uh, the situation uh, without uh, bigger damages. Uh, in a way, the interesting thing is that, that this will teach us uh, to show that don't take these things as granted. I think that we have taken that Arctic cooperation is, is, is going to, to be uh, resilient and, and it's going to run in any case because mm -hmm. we have a past few tests uh, already and, and challenges. But, but this is a real challenge. Uh, so we, we really have to think uh, twice and rethink that how, how we are going to, to, to maintain the good connections and, 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 and continue uh, to pass this uh, challenging situation and continue cooperation. Well, and, and you mentioned that we, you know, we've, we've had an easy, for a while, uh, or at least simple in Arctic cooperation for the last, you know, couple of decades. Um, and so for myself, you know, as a mid-career scholar, uh, probably started looking at the Arctic in the 2000s. And of course, Arctic cooperation came out of the ashes of the Cold War. So, so we haven't, you know, in one sense, it's new for the Arctic to have to deal with the spillover from geopolitics. Let's talk a little bit about the history of, of Arctic cooperation uh, and, and, and how, you know, how it has been resilient, I would say, in the last 20 years to you know, some other Russian incursions, some other geopolitical events. Well, yeah, indeed. I mean, I, mean, I would say that Arctic cooperation uh, has been a, a real success story uh, because it has been so 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 resilient, it has been uh, it has been deepened, uh, and and even today we can say that that one proof of that, one evidence of that is that we don't have regional armed conflicts in the Arctic region today, and we have not had that uh, uh, after the end of the Cold War, and actually we didn't have that during the Cold. War. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that, that it's, uh, it, it's, it has been said that, uh, well, that Arctic cooperation or, or high geopolitical stability of the Arctic, it's exceptional. I would say maybe, but that's not the point. The point is that, that uh, this has been uh, according, uh, this has been by the eight Arctic states because this has been mutually beneficial. 
So there are these common uh, interests behind. And that is a real moti uh, motivation for uh, those actors, Arctic states, but, but of course I should mention also Arctic indigenous peoples who have played very important role here. And actually they, uh, we are pushing Arctic states to start uh, this kind of cooperation. So, and, and, and again, I mean, maybe we should go back a little bit and study this. Why, how, what really happened, what were the, 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 the driving forces behind? And then, like I said earlier, how, how to pass this current situation without uh, bigger damages. So, so we've been resilient before. So if I think about the 2007, you know, Russian flag planting, and there was, you know, some, some alarmism over that, that probably wasn't justified. But the 2008 invasion of, of uh, Georgia, the 2014 uh, invasion of, you know, how are we resilient to those and what makes this time different for the Arctic? Well, I mean, because I mean, first time it's, it's so, so that it's not only, it's not anymore the Arctic Eighth as, 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 a, as, a, as a club, not exactly exclusive club because it was uh, together the Arctic states uh, plus uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, and you, you remember well, and many others that we had uh, another club, Arctic Five, as an exclusive club, meaning the, the, the five coastal states of the Arctic Ocean. But, but that was more ad hoc uh, meeting or two meetings actually, and the, the uh, declaration, which was useful, but then we went back to the main track uh, so that there we are eight. But, but now if the seven uh, Arctic states made that statement to pause the cooperation and, and, and it means then Russia is excluded. So this is a new situation. But I mean, then we come to the, to the, to the original uh, reasons why uh, why and structures why we have this cooperation. And I think that there we have not had changes because Arctic cooperation has from the very beginning built on functional cooperation on, on, on certain fields, fields of low politics. And, and, and they are still there. Right. So I wanna make the point that this is dramatically different from responses that we've had in the last 20 years where Arctic Council cooperation has been suspended. Uh, we've seen uh, in 2014, some levels of cooperation were suspended. There were some economic sanctions, but the Arctic Council was able to continue its work. Now we're seeing, and it happens to be the Russian Arctic Council chairmanship. Uh, so that's very much, you know, will there be a chairmanship? It seems very unlikely that any high level, you know, delegations from the Western countries would go to Russia. Um, so things are very different, but I, but you, you bring up, you know, that, this isn't the first time, you know, it's the first time maybe for me as an Arctic scholar seeing this, it's not the first time for you thinking of the Cold War, thinking about when Russia was excluded, when the Soviet Union was excluded, and the work that it took in the 1980s to build some Arctic cooperation of that. And I think it's going to have lessons for us in five years, 10 years, we'll see how long this goes on. So what was, you know, remind us for those, you know, for those of us don't have your experience, what was the theory, what was the thinking? of functional cooperation, of the role that it could play in a situation such as the Cold War, in a situation such as this? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, and, 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 and before going there, I mean, I, I, would, I would like uh, to, to say one thing, and, and that is uh, to echo what you said, that this is a totally new situation. And, and because in the Cold War, there was something uh, uh, which we, we, or many, like I have mentioned that to my students, they think that, oh, well, what is that? And that is uh, that the, the, the Arctic, eight, Arctic eight, uh, uh, the eight Arctic states, so there was not any, any that kind of cooperation yet, but, but they agreed that they disagree on, on certain issues. Mm -hmm. and, and particularly, I mean, USA and the, the Soviet Union disagreed. And this was very important because then they created procedures and structures for the situation. We remember after the Cuban crisis, it was the, uh, the, the hotline between Moscow and Washington DC, very important. And then arms control, this uh, disarmament. But now 
we don't have these uh, procedures and structures. And that's why, I mean, to me, this, this is, uh, when if you think about world politics, this is uh, a dangerous situation. So that is different. But, but when in the Cold War, you had these procedures and structures, and then, like I mentioned earlier, indigenous peoples started to become concerned on, uh, on uh, state of the environment, environmental degradation. And, and, and then comes the functional cooperation. So the functional cooperation on environmental protection and, and, and then science, uh, on, on science. So they were the two, two most important things before climate change be, became there. But I mean, and, and behind there is, is, is very much the, the theory of functionalism, uh, uh, starting from David Mitrani uh, in 1940s and, and then a few, few others. And the, the beauty of that is that it's very flexible, mm -hmm. that you don't build any, any blocks or unions or uh, you don't make any statements. You simply start cooperation. And, and because it's flexible, it is uh, easy to, 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 to change according what the, what is the situation and then go deeper if the parties are ready. So, and, and according to that theory, this, this was to build trust uh, between former rivals or even enemies, if you wish. And, and so that in the Arctic, we have really seen that, that this theory has been functioning very, very well. Uh, and that's why, I mean, you mentioned Arctic Council, that's why there is this very, very famous uh, quote now that it does not, the cooperation does, does not deal with military security. And that mm -hmm. is exactly uh, according to that idea uh, that we start by uh, certain fields, the cooperation, which are, are fields of law politics and then by doing we build confidence and then toward some kind of uh, peaceful change so so by that way this is really alternative to a conflict what we have done and again we have seen the the the, the outcomes and 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 now the, the 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 question is that that how we should apply this theory or other theories and or, or even develop it further that we can pass uh, this this current uh, uh, crisis so i want to emphasize some of your points for the audience so not you know not everyone has studied functionalism in school uh, and the theory of it but but as as we're in this low point in relations with russia for very good reasons we have to start thinking about what it, whatever are going to be the steps that at some point, at some day, we're going to want those relations to improve. And, and especially in the Arctic where Russia is half of the Arctic and half of the people in the Arctic. So, so this functionalism is talking about how can we cooperate in a non-political environment that we can understand why the states can't cooperate, why there are economic sanctions, why a lot of that has been severed. But at what level can we have cooperation in a non-political context? And then also, you know, how is it in our interests to either completely sever? And, you know, we said, you know, an easy thing would be for an institution to say no, no more Russian conferences, no, no more Russian speaking, uh, no more talking to Russians. But where does that get us in 10 years? And so another part of the theory is that we want to soften antagonism at that civil society level to pave the way that we can have better state cooperation, better economic cooperation at some point in the future. And so what is the role, you know, there's a history of, of Arctic science diplomacy, of, of science and environmental cooperation. And we can talk about indigenous people's cooperation too, paving that way of softening that antagonism and paving the way for better state cooperation. Well, yeah, exactly. And 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 I mean, I, I think that, uh, that uh... We have still those elements there, and 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 you 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 remind me about the the fact that the starting point was exactly before even any 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 scholars started to think about to apply uh, the the theory of functionalism. It was simply that indigenous peoples, like I said, they became concerned on the state of the environment where they live. So pollution, that was long runs, water and uh, pollution. So they were exactly, uh, I mean, they were the actors, non-state actors in the, in the level of civil societies. 
who we are pushing governments to do something. And, and, and again, I mean, when we will have a restart here, uh, reset and, and continue, then, then again, I think that we need these non-state uh, actors, uh, either indigenous peoples, uh, scientific community or, or, or individual scholars, scientists, or indigenous peoples to do that. And, and, and I mean, again, if, if, if 30, 35 years ago it was pollution, now it's, it's climate change. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, uh, if we think about uh, uh, and read the, the latest report by IPCC, uh, the, uh, the IPCC as an international organization is becoming more important security actor than NATO is because that is the most existential threat what we can have. And, and so there, 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 there is very good reason to come back and start cooperation. Because I mean, it's, it's our, 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 uh, our, our common interest to do something because we all benefit. It's not any zero sum game, it's win-win, real win-win situation. Right, so just going back to the history, I mean, we had the first international polar year. I think that was 1954, 1955. So kind of, you know, post-World War II in the depths of the Cold War before you had, you know, the red phone. Um, scientists were cooperating on, on the, in the Arctic, on the polar year. And Russian scientists are actually excellent at Arctic science. Mm -hmm. uh, and many important things, you know, uh, geologically, environmentally happen in the Russian Arctic, you know, that, that we need to keep an eye on, that we need to monitor. And then the other interesting thing was in 1973, you had the Polar Bear Treaty, and that included uh, the Soviet Union, Canada, uh, Denmark with Greenland, United States, and Norway. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the first acts of Arctic cooperation were scientific, really. And now, how do you see this playing out in the next 10 years? Do you think there will be a pause on scientific cooperation, or do you think, you know, what is, what is the right amount of time? When will it be too soon? to continue with the scientific cooperation? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that if we, we, we are, we are uh, making inventory of, uh, of all the levels of scientific cooperation, what we have now, I mean, there are a few levels where it has not been stopped. It's not in post. And, and that is of course, between individuals and, 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 and like we, we both belong to, to one thematic network under the auspices of the University of the Arctic thematic network on, uh, on, on geopolitics and security. So, so we, we started their brainstorming on, 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 on how to maintain the connections and, and, and continue cooperation. And there we have uh, scholars uh, from all over the, the, the Arctic region, including the Russian Federation. So, so, I mean, I think it's very important to keep uh, some of these connections uh, active. Of course, it's, it's totally based on the individuals. And, and, and this is something that they, they have to make the choice. They have to be willing uh, if they would like to, to continue. It's totally understandable if they think that not just now. But, but I mean, if we can keep few of those uh, connections uh, uh, in for, for, for simply even for, for change information, that would be very valuable. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then when the time is more, more ripe, then, then we can extend to that. So let's talk about the ethics of, of some of this issue, which you know, probably everyone watching this webinar and, and most of the people in the Arctic Circle network are grappling with right now. And is that, it, that is how do we, how do we cooperate with, with Russians now? And there's some you know, ethical quandaries that we're facing. And on the one hand, you know, I personally think, you know, Russia has clearly violated international law. Russia, the state should be sanctioned. There should be economic sanctions applied. But we all have, we all have personally worked, co-authored, uh, collaborated with Russian scholars, Russian nationals, and then Russians who, who now live in different countries. And so it is a very personal issue. And to think of excluding them because of something that their state did doesn't feel comfortable, doesn't, and it doesn't seem like it's in anyone's long-term interest. On the other hand, I can see a perspective if you're a Ukrainian scholar to say, you know, there, there are terrible things 
uh, if Russian citizens aren't punished, if Russian institutions aren't punished, then there'll be no pressure on the Russian state to act differently. So how, how are you coming out on all this? Where are you finding yourself in this gray zone? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you that we, we should make difference uh, between uh, official states institutions and, and, and individuals. So I, I, I mean, I know, I know several Russian scholars, many of them are, no, are more than my colleagues, they are my friends. So one thing is I, I trust them, that they, they know what they can do. Because of course, I feel that I have responsibilities. I, I cannot and I, I do not demand them to be active. I, I only ask uh, if, if you are interested in, if you are willing, and if you, your situation allows that, uh, that you will do that, then please. But if not, then then uh, totally understandable. And and I mean, there has to be mutual respect. And this is, of course, how we have built the whole whole thematic network. And 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 for those who don't know this this thematic network, I can say that this was from the very beginning built on uh, on on individuals. We never have had any institutions as members. And this is, of course, now. This is very, very. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a strength to us uh, because then we can do and continue this discussion between individuals and keep it on 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 that level. But then, of course, I I I I once more say that then it's up to each member what he or she would like to do, but it's possible, and to make this possible, I think that is it's 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 some kind. Of, when we started, it, that was so far. I I knew that was the first proactive thing here. So not only to react the situation or give some statements like institutions, but to do something to be uh, uh, proactive and 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 try to create some kind of 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 dialogue which could be maybe not just now but in, in the near future useful. Right now we are grappling with this. Personally, because as the editor and the managing editor of the Arctic Yearbook, uh, you know, it's been a point of pride for us to have many Russian contributions in the past, to have high quality English language open access articles from Russian uh, authors in Russia, uh, you know, to learn about LNG, you know, workers in, in Yamal, to learn about uh, Indigenous public health in Yakutsk, um, to learn about climate change policy in Russia. And, and how are we to develop uh, climate change policies, security policies, uh, economic development policies? If in the Arctic, if we don't understand that Russian point of view, if we don't have good quality information from good quality scholars. And, and it just so happened that we chose this year Arctic yearbook theme is uh, Russia, the Russian Arctic. Uh, and we chose that theme, of course, back in December. Uh, and so, why, you know, what have been our deliberations last see of whether we should continue with the theme, uh, how we how would we adapt or not uh, to publishing a whole volume on Russia and the Arctic in, two, in 2022? Well, I mean, yeah, like you said, <laughs> that we, we decided the theme already in December before knowing uh, this, this uh, current situation. Uh, and I think that the, the, the cool thing uh, is that we decided that because we thought that the Russian Arctic is so important part of the, the, the Arctic region. And because, like you said, there are, there are uh, so many excellent Russian, Russian scholars and, and, and uh, scientists doing research uh, in, the, in the Arctic. Uh, and, and, and one more thing, and because there is language barrier, so that there is so much good uh, uh, so many good uh, reports, uh, uh, studies in the Russia, which have been published in, in, in Russian, and we don't know what is that. And, and, and I, I think that in the very beginning of the, when, when we started to publish the Arctic Yearbook, we, we, that, that started to become very important uh, aspect there. And, and we, have had, we have been very happy to have so many good uh, Russian authors during uh, these years. 
and again uh, we 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 got several abstracts from Russian authors. So, so I mean, yes, absolutely, we are going to be that publication who is who is having this kind of uh, uh, publishing policy, so that it's only based on quality, and 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 we have the the same uh, peer review uh, process, and we are going to 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 treat all the articles equally, and then hope to have that we have, will have very comprehensive picture what the, the, the Russian Arctic will be. And most probably there will be rather uh, big interest in, 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 in broader audience, I mean, internationally or globally. Mm -hmm. Before I move on, I have some great questions for the audience. I encourage you to submit more. Submit more. I'll, be, I'll be turning to those in about one minute, but one more question for you, Lassie, just following up on this. What has been the opinion or the perspective of our Russian colleagues? What is their perspective on, on what should go forward you know, with, with academic cooperation that you've been speaking with? Well, I mean, so far, what, what I have been uh, discussed with them and what I have heard, uh, all, all those, of course, I mean, there are different opinions among them. Uh, and, and, and like you mentioned earlier, those, those who have left the country after the war started and those who have decided to stay, of course, they have a little bit different uh, point of view, understandable. But, but I mean, all in all, uh, all are saying that, yes, we, we should continue and we will be ready to contribute whatever uh, is our location now and then. Uh, because all, all those, they, they, they value the cooperation uh, so much, so high. So that I, I, I think that, the, that that is something where, where we, we are exactly on, on, on the same line. Great. So the first audience question I'm going to go to is from Katerina Levitskaya. And she's talking about the suspension of the activities of the Arctic Council. For her, this is problematic because it affects the implementation of the 10 year strategic plan, uh, affects the development of the common Arctic region, affects you know, all the activities of the working group. What is your opinion on, on the Arctic Council suspending its activities, suspending its cooperation with Russia? And what would you need to see to bring it back on track? When do you think would be the, the right time? What would have to change to get the Arctic Council to start cooperating again? Well, uh, not easy question, but good question. Uh, yeah, I, I understand totally that that people who are involved in uh, the work of Arctic Council and its working groups are concerned because of this. And 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 the the interesting thing is that big part of of uh, or reason for that concern is that because it has been so good, there has been good progress in that cooperation, and people really would like to go go further and 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 and, and have more progress there. So that they they are in a way they are they are hungry toward that, and and I mean I I, I think that each uh, I mean in each Arctic state, uh, what you can do is 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 continue Arctic research, uh, try to 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 uh, make uh, the expertise better in your country and and like like. Uh, I mean, the, now we say that there are the seven Arctic states uh, having that same statement. But I mean, before that, we had already five Arctic states. I mean, the Nordic countries doing multilateral cooperation on Arctic issues as well. So, I mean, that has been there all the time. And it, it is, again, it can be used now for, 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 for this situation in, in order to keep it going. Uh, so that I, I think there are many ways uh, how to do that. And again, because it, it is flexible. So I, I, I trust that uh, in each country, those who, who are in charge will find uh, could, uh, the best ways to do that and, and people in the working groups as well. Then your question that when we are ready to, to come back to the track. Oh yeah, very difficult to say, but, but I think that the, the precondition for that is that you really feel that you are ready. I mean, the benefits are bigger than the costs of like that you might lose some reputation because someone's are thinking that, but then that the benefits are bigger than that. Then 
you you are ready to come. Then of course, I mean, if if I don't know if 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 there will be some kind of ceasefire in in Ukraine soon, and and then if if USA and and Russia will 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 have some real negotiations and will have some solutions, of course, then then that will make it it possible to 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 come back even uh, even early. That is that. Uh, High politics or, or, or even great power politics, but 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 then of course I, I think that we all we can, I mean we should have sensors out and think about that that how we can promote uh, the, the 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 process so that it might be be a bit uh, faster than 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 we might expect. Right. For myself, I see you know we've had an Arctic eight. And I think it'll be an Arctic seven for a while. Um, you know, thinking very frankly, I think it, it will be hard so long as Putin is in power for Western states to come back to the table. Uh, but and we saw that it was a G8 and then it was a G7. Um, you know, and so I could, but I could start to see a seven plus kinds of activities, especially at that scientific level, at a, a non-state level. Um, and I think you're right. A lot of the work of the working groups is is scientists and and NGOs, and doesn't require state state permission. You know, certainly not in the Western world to continue with that. And so a lot of the work of the working groups, I think, can and should continue, um, and with some you know Russian scientific participation. Uh, but in terms of the Arctic Council. Um, I feel like it might be years uh, of an A7 format uh, before we return to anything resembling what we had in 2021. Mm, yeah, well, I, I would like to add that, that, of course, that is that is the that is not that the Arctic Council which we we have learned to know, but but then of course, I mean, uh, fortunately, it is not only about the Arctic Council. And, and, and it's working groups like we discussed uh, earlier. So it's it's there are several levels, there are several components as part of the 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 the, 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 the whole Arctic cooperation. So that that even the Arctic Council, uh, including eight Arctic states, is is paused for a while. Then there are other elements, other levels where cooperation can be continued. Right. I want to turn to a question from Stephen Van Dyne, my friend back in here in Canada. Uh, and he says, what is the real risk of drawing a hard line today and rejecting all Russian engagement? Um, Ten years from now, we can revisit to see if the circumstance warranted, but we're, we're facing those decisions now. What are the unintended consequences of rejecting Russian engagement at the scientific level and then at the economic and political levels? I think the answer is different for those different levels. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, very good uh, question. I mean, starting from 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 that that which is most important to me, and 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 and, and again, what was the origin for for the for 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 the cooperation, the the the, the niche uh, meaning, I mean, environmental protection and all all dealing with uh, uh, pollution, uh, biodiversity. Uh, and, and climate change. I mean, yeah. If I mean, all each month, each year, what we will we will be without this uh, multilateral cooperation will will be uh, rather bad. Because I mean, we we should. I mean, thinking thinking that the Russian Arctic is about forty percent or so of the Arctic region. So we 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 absolutely we need. All the time, the information, what is going on, and then cooperation. And and so 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 there, I I, I would say that if we we will lose uh, several years because of this, that that would be really bad. Mm -hmm. Then uh, of course, I mean about economic activities, you can even say that well, if that it will mean that there will be less economic activities, then it would be good for the environment. But of course. That will mean we know that uh, that in, in in from the point of view of geopolitics and geoeconomics, that will mean that there will be more uh, economic activities uh, and cooperation between Russia and East Asia, first of all, uh, with China. So it doesn't mean necessarily that there will be less economic activities 
but it will be the di direction will be mostly to that direction. So what does it mean then? Uh, how how to if there is time when 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 there is a need again, or Western countries would like to have more economic cooperation with Russia, then of course it's not going to be that that easy. And and then comes scientific cooperation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's not that dramatic if we will uh, not have that kind. Uh, I mean, these conferences, meetings, workshops going on every year because there is technology we can continue uh, by using uh, high-tech uh, communication uh, lines and so on. But, but of course, in the long run, again, uh, when, when, when you either, either you, you isolate someone, someone's or let them to isolate themselves, it's, it's bad for science, which, which is universal. Uh, and, and, and should be uh, that, but of course that could happen. And, and, and may, I, I think that there we can easily come back after a few years. Right. Well, let's put on our big geopolitics hats and think about some of these big issues. You alluded to China and Ian Livermore has a question too. What room is there for China to take advantage of the pause in, in Arctic cooperation and Arctic Council? And for me, you know, you, you think about, you, you, we were redrawing kind of the geopolitical map as we speak. You know, this is a, this is a uh, follow the Berlin Wall moment. It's 9-11 moment. And now we're having the 2022 Ukraine war and, and things are changing. And Russia, I think enough time has passed that it's clear that Russia is going to be a loser uh, in this situation, that Russia will have a weaker economy, weaker standing, um, uh, and, and it'll be harmful for Russia. It's obviously harmful for Ukraine. This is not a war that they chose, but it's obviously harmful for them. And I think it, Europe is not a winner in this either. You know, there, there's some, some very hard economic pain because of the sanctions, because of the natural gas that they're feeling now and will feel for you know the next year or two or three or five. Um, but if I, of anyone, it looks like China might be a winner in all this, that China will be better off geopolitically vis-a-vis um, -vis everyone else uh, after this because Russia has nowhere to go but to China. And so how do you see, does China get an advantage globally, geopolitically? And does China get an advantage in the Arctic because of these circumstances? Well, yeah, I mean, of course, this is this is rather much so far a speculation. Uh, maybe, but but we should remember that that uh, the the current uh, regime in China already for a few decades have been saying that stability, geopolitical stability, is the most important thing for for China. And, and that together with, with economic growth uh, in, inside uh, China, uh, because that is uh, within the country, that is the best way to, 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 to secure that there is stability, political mm -hmm. stability there. So, so if, if, if this will, if, if this will uh, be escalated, then it's, it's not necessarily good for, for, for China. Uh, but I mean, in a, in, a, in a short run, maybe because of what I said earlier, economic cooperation between Russia and China will be tightened and, and all, all economic cooperation together with political uh, cooperation. Actually, you cannot have uh, economic cooperation continuing without political uh, uh, cooperation. So they go hand, hand in hand, but, but I mean, maybe so, but, but, but then what really will be the, the benefit uh, for China in the long run, I, I don't really, really know, uh, or, or I don't dare to say. Of course, China is, is there all the time thinking that if, if this means that the West is becoming weaker and, and actually and, uh, including the USA, and, and so they are going to win this, this big, big battle between the great powers then maybe they are calculating like, like that. But, but then another thing is from, from the, I mean, the other side of the coin, like you said, absolutely Europe is, is among the losers. Russia yeah. ab absolutely is a loser, but also Europe. And, and, and so that in Europe, I, I, I'm, I have been a little bit surprised that we have not understood that when 
it's a crime to start a war, but when a war has started, then politics and diplomacy have failed. And there you have more than one party. You have several parties. So, so European Union and NATO, many uh, countries, including Finland, have been involved in. So yes, we are losing here, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And 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 I, I think that this is something what we should think about more carefully a bit earlier. Yeah. So let's move on to economics. Uh, and Arthur Seymour has a question here. Uh, there's this pause near to council, and there's economic sanctions. Um, how does that affect economic opportunities in the Russian Arctic and the Northern Sea Route, especially? So we have seen dramatic uh, economic response from oil giants pulling out, um, puts a lot of, of, of Russian Arctic oil and gas development at risk. Uh, it's a technical area. It's not, you know, it's, you need a lot of expertise. You need a lot of capital uh, that some of those big Western, you know, um, oil giants brought. Do you think this will carry on in the background? Do you think you know the economics support it, and so it'll just go on, or do you think there will be differences to Russian Arctic development, oil and gas development, and the Northern Sea Route? Um, I not, not in the not in the short run. I, I, I think because because I mean all 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 bigger states are depending on 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 on. On, on, on fossil uh, fossils and 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 on on, on, on that, uh, I mean oil and oil and gas. So so then they they cannot make sanctions to to stop uh, export of of oil and gas from from Russia. Uh, and and if if so, then they have to a certain extent they have to share technology. And and we have seen this that investments to to uh, hydrocarbons. And that oil industry have been increased. Uh, I mean, it started already end of last year. It has been e extended uh, this year, or even before the Ukraine war started, and, and then of course after that. So, so here, here we have interdependence <laughs> between all, 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 all the parties, and and so that it's it's not not easy at all to make that kind of thing. And then of course come come that how credible are the sanctions? If, if there are several big EU member states, for example, who are uh, uh, importing uh, uh, natural gas and oil from Russia, and then they try to say that you should not cooperate with Russia. Like, like here, like I said, I'm, I'm here in Torshavn. We yesterday met the, the House of Industry of, of the Faroe Islands, and they, they were really, uh, so skeptical toward the European Union because of the sanctions. Because I mean, this this uh, uh, auto autonomy uh, autonomic entity is totally depending on, on on fisheries, and Russia is 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 very very big uh, client of uh, uh, fish products. So they would like to continue uh, this cooperation. It's 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 uh, it's uh, in pause now, but but. It could be continue if 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 there will be agreement. So so I mean, those uh, great I mean bigger actors, great powers, they should be very careful in, with these sanctions because it, they should be fair and credible, and then they should be uh, exactly uh, following those and and be logical there. I I, I think I think. You know, living in Alberta, that's the center of oil and gas in, in Canada, have learned a lot about the industry. And it's very complicated. You know, I think people think if there's oil, you can just get it. You know, if there's investment, you can just get it. But but there's, you know, there's pressures on production everywhere, not not even because of this, because of the logistics, because of getting the labor, because of getting the parts that you need, you know, to drill, to to, you know, to ship, to export. Uh, and if if there are some sanctions and there are just on the parts that you need to drill that oil, you know, it could be a two thousand dollar part that's holding up, you know, a, a ten thousand dollar barrel a day operation. And so how, you know, the challenges that Russian Arctic oil and gas development is now facing it, it will make that LNG much more expensive. And so I agree with you, China is, will still demand and will still pay for that LNG. And that's not a problem for China. But it's going to be more expensive. Things will not be on on time, um, and it, you know it'll be problematic to do these very technical projects without 
the, you know, the benefit of, of global manufacturing and, and expertise. And I think the Russians did get pretty good because we've had some sanctions since 2014. Uh, but I think a pullout, you know, a real pullout, you know, that we're seeing now, um, you know, of American oil companies and, and Europeans and the service companies, I think that's going to have an effect, um, you know, regardless of the politics of the situations, getting down to logistics now. Um, mm. But anyways, and the Northern Sea Route, I also wonder how economic, it is a very expensive route to, you know, provide support to ice breaking support, logistical support, um, ice, you know, ice data. If all you have is China using it and Russia using it, and you don't have any European clients, you don't have any American, uh, North American clients, I wonder how viable also the NSR, how unviable it becomes. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. But, but then uh, on the other hand, like you mentioned that, that Russia, uh, after the, the sanctions uh, 2014, Russia has created a lot their their own uh, own buffers, uh, ha having that that huge state fund, um, uh, mostly from uh, from oil and, and gas, the money from oil and gas industry, but uh, and and then some other structures and 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 uh, production within the country, but then. When it comes to LNG uh, at Yamal and and, uh, and the the the, the uh, Arctic uh, two LNG uh, factor there, I mean think about the the investments. Russia mm -hmm. has invest invested huge amount of, of 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 money there, so that they they would like to have something coming out from from that, and it could be that then it is only between uh, Russia and China, or if there will be some other Eastern European uh, country who, who, who is not following the, the sanction by, by, by the USA and, and, and the European Union, they might join uh, later. So it, it, is, it is possible. But, but then comes, of course, this issue that, that I mean, after the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we have had a shortage of supplies, like in, in, in North America and, and in Europe. So, so because of logistics, so that, that there are the bottlenecks in, in, in several harbors. So that in the long run, will the Northern Sea routes give some kind of alternative way or solution to that? Uh, I, I can't say, but it is, in theory, it is possible. Right. Let's do a little bit of military security before we return and finish off with a bit more on, on scientific diplomacy. We have two questions, one from Victoria Nicotina. Um, and where was the other question? Bill Featherstone has something on this too, but thinking of the hard security and owner Limon does also, all, all familiar names, thinking of hard military security, I, I think, first of all, I wanna preface this, Canada's budget comes out today and it's highly expected that we'll have a huge increase in military funding. And there's you know some committee hearings right now on, on uh, security in the Arctic. And there's a sense that we need to be more vigilant in the Arctic because Russia is obviously a bit of a rogue actor and, and a danger and a threat. And so I, so how are you seeing this play out in terms of military response, NATO response in the Arctic, Western response in the Arctic? Do you think this can trigger an arms race? Um, and do you think this will trigger more military spending and, and more hostility in the Arctic region? Well, I mean, more military spending in, in, in general, of course, in, in, in the global scale, yes, absolutely, which is really, really a bad thing in a way, because we, we, we have been going other way and, and, and uh, we have decreased uh, this military budget, but, but not necessarily in the, in the Arctic, because again, I mean, there are no regional armed conflicts in the Arctic. And and uh, and most, uh, I mean, and I mean, unlikely will happen in the near in the near future. But in a way, I have seen that this has started a bit earlier. So that it was the trigger was not the Ukraine war. It was something what what we have seen already for for some time. And this uh, we have discussed it. And 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 there 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 have been some misinterpretations of of that what. If Russia has more economic uh, interests in the Arctic, so it 
it might be one consequence that then they might be a little bit more, I mean, militarily a bit more present there. I mean, I mean, this is universal. This is very, very natural. So that if we read everything what, what Russia is doing by that way, that it means that Russia would like to be more aggressive than its misery. Because I mean, the same is, 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 is with, with, with NATO member states. If they have economic activities, then they think that, okay, it's part of what we have to, to de defend. And it's, it's very, very understandable. So that I, my answer would be that not, not necessarily. And, 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 I, and, and again, it's nothing new that we have been saying this for, for long, that because the, the military uh, structures in the Arctic, they are for the global deterrence because they are mostly nuclear weapon systems by, by USA and, and Russia, those of Russia. So that, of course, if what, if what in whatever part of the globe will happen something, the reflection or spillover, if you would, uh, if you wish, can happen in the Arctic. But so far we have not seen that. And, and I, I, I hope, and I'm, I'm really thinking that it's not in, in Russian, Russia's interest to do that, but no. Yeah, I have to say, you know, and we've been on the same page with this and, and some of the viewers will be familiar with our more dovish views, I guess, that, that, that there is no good political and, uh, you know, reason to have conflict, to build up military uh, in, in the Arctic. Those, you know, we're not, the, the problems we have can't be resolved with military solutions. And so it doesn't make sense. And yet I'm very certain at a political level that Western countries, and I'm seeing it in Canada now, are going to put more money into Arctic security as a political response to Russian aggression. Because how our mind thinks of it in Canada is that Russia's in the Arctic, Russia is bad. Therefore, we need more military defense in the Arctic. And so I think it may be important, you know, to fully articulate what what would make sense in terms of defense in the Arctic, stewardship in the Arctic, security in the Arctic, that isn't just throwing $10 billion you know, at the problem because Russia's in the Ukraine right now. Um, but we only have a few minutes left and I do wanna get back to this, you know, some of the elements of, of cooperation. And we mentioned briefly climate change. When I think about areas that are critical to have Russian scientific, academic, civil society engagement, Climate change is probably number one, and we've said it already, it's half of the Arctic. And so if you want to, if you think it's important to monitor those changes, uh, to see how methane is coming out of the permafrost in, in Siberia, uh, see how animals are being affected, um, to see how black carbon is having, you know, effects and, and um, you know, all kind of the knock-on effects that you're seeing, then you need to understand what's happening in the Russian Arctic. And this isn't really a time that we can afford to not understand what's happening environmentally in the Russian Arctic. But it's not just climate change. You know, a lot of the social science that we've done, the humanities research that has been done has been with Russian people. And there's, you know, there's half of people of the Arctic are in Russia also, and a lot of them are indigenous. And so, and from an indigenous people's perspective, they never drew the map. They never put Russia on one side and, and Finland on the other and, and Alaska on the other. There are still family cultural connections amongst the Inuit, amongst the Sami across these borders. Uh, and so this, this probably, this wouldn't affect their calculation on wanting to cooperate with, you know, their, you know, their ancestors, their relatives across, you know, the way. So how do you see, what are areas of Arctic cooperation that you think are essential to maintain some level of collaboration? And how do you think that can be done? Well, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, what you, what you said. Uh, and, and, and I mean, even you said that I, I, would, I would repeat and say, say climate change is, is absolutely number one. And, and like I, if if like we, I think we, we many of us remember very well when there was this big international project mosaic, when 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 they were there uh, one one winter uh, on 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 the ice of the Arctic Ocean, and and exploring there, I mean this is something what Russia has been uh, doing since 1930s, uh, these ice stations. And I, I remember as, as a young researcher when I read it, that was exciting. Uh, they did that, uh, having that technology at the time. And, and it has been very valuable to know, know how, how the, 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 the ice uh, of, of the Arctic Ocean is, is moving, et, et cetera. 
So yeah, I, I mean, it, 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 it is very important to continue that. And then comes uh, permafrost. I mean, where you have the biggest part of permafrost <laughs> in yeah. the Arctic, it's it's absolutely in the in the in in in, in the in the Russian Federation, uh, Siberia. I mean, and and that, which is which is something what like in Finland we don't know because we don't have permafrost, so we don't really know what is there, what is the dynamics, what, what is the the methane releases, and etc. So so this is very important part of that. And it's of course dealing with climate change, but it's also dealing with uh, uh, dealing with uh, biodiversity and, and dealing with uh, the uh, people living there, because you like you mentioned indigenous peoples, yeah, their livelihoods, what they do there, and they still have um, uh, reindeer husbandry, husbandry uh, by this traditional way, and 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 that that is very valuable to to continue because then. They, they will read a, a nature all the time and then we might have experiences how it is to, to have together new economic activities and, and these traditional livelihoods. And so far I know it's only in the Russian Arctic what you, where you can do this. Uh, and then, 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 then few few other things. Uh, and one of those is that there you have the big cities <laughs> located in the Arctic region. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So that that one is collapsing permafrost is one thing, but also uh, how how you what kind of technology you you have to uh, to create in in order to heat the houses there uh, uh, to to build the the communication lines and 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 uh, and, and how to organize traffic etc. So very valuable information, which without uh, having uh, Russians involved in we will not have. Right. So my last question for you, lastly, before we wrap up, um, you know, it's just thinking of the future. What is the best? What is, you know, if if everything started turning good now, in 10 years, what do you think is the best we can hope for in regards to Russian Arctic relations? And then what do we need to do in the next year to make sure that that, you know, ideal outcome in 10 years comes about? Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, not to predict anything, but... But, but try to say that, yes, if we are back on the track after, after 10 years, then, then absolutely, then it would be good. And, and in order to make it possible, I, I think that, that simply we have to, to continue this and, and we have to try to find out the ways how, how to have communication lines uh, open and, and, and not in a way to, to, to try to point those who, who are uh, agreeing with us on, on, on the most important uh, issues, but to cooperate uh, with them. And then one more thing, I think we cannot be intellectually lazy here. And I have got this feeling that someone's are thinking, I mean, to give a statement, it's very easy, but, but to really to think, what you can do, how you can uh, develop the methods and what kind of new methods you might need. That is not that easy, but, but then we cannot be, as I said, lazy intellectually, but we have to think and rethink. Right, and how I've, you know, and we talked about it, but I think there is danger if, if we, ice, you know, the Russian state isolated itself, Putin isolated himself, but Russian scholars and Russian scientists have not isolated themselves. You know, they don't deserve to be isolated. And I think there's a real danger. You know, I don't think we want a Cold War for 30 years. And I think that would be destabilizing and it would be not in our interests. And with climate change and security and energy and indigenous peoples, there's not a good reason to do it. So to think about what our institutions and what our conferences um, and what, you know, journal publishers do over the next six months to not give Russian scholars and scientists a reason to not be engaged, to not do the science, to not share their results, to not be exposed to other ideas. Um, and to, and to, and so that to preclude, you know, that in 2032, things can get back on track. So to do things now that make sure that we do have, uh, you know, that exit, um, you know, if you're driving down the road, make sure we have as many exits as possible, as many options as possible open to us. Um, to, to have constructive Russian cooperation in the Arctic in the future. Any last words you wanted to add, lastly, before we finish up? 
Well, I, I, I only would like to, to, to add what you said that indeed, and, and sometimes uh, the, 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 the ways uh, how you can do things are not that complicated. Uh, and to me, I mean, I have done that earlier. My, I have studied on, on, on cooperation and, 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 and things like that. But again, I, I'm, I'm going back to that, that I mean, this kind of way to cooperate is actually the best way to build confidence between parties. So that simple is that. Yeah, I agree. I thank you for our conversation today. Lastly, interesting as always, hopefully we can do it over a beer one day. I wanna thank all the audience members for your great participation, the great questions and to Arctic Circle for uh, hosting us today. This will be recorded and will be uh, on the website later and probably also as a podcast. So you can find it or share it from the website uh, of the Arctic Circle organization. And just stay tuned. There's some new uh, exciting other webcasts coming up, one on marine conservation in May and one on mental health in the Arctic in June. So watch for those. Thanks for participating and have a great day.